Panel Debate Show. Joining me in the studio for the next hour, Steve Norris, for conf- former Conservative Minister and London Mayoral Candidate, Siobhan Benita, a Liberal Democrat candidate for London Mayor in 2020, the Guardian columnist Zoe Williams and Gideon Falter, Chairman of the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism. Let me remind you, you can watch us on the LBC website at lbc.co.uk, on the Twitter feed at LBC, on the LBC Facebook page and on YouTube. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet Headphone. at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale on LBC. Right, let's crack on with the first question. Graham is in Bushy. Graham, what's your question, please? Hi, Ian. Hi. My question is, was the expulsion of Alistair Campbell yesterday a cynical ploy by Labour to deflect from the EHRC investigation into their anti-Semitism? You old cynic, Graham. I know I am. Um, let's go to Gideon Falter. Well, it was quite extraordinary because what we see is Alistair Campbell, a very senior Labour figure who's been responsible for some of Labour's biggest electoral successes, and within 24 hours of admitting that he'd voted Liberal Democrat, he's expelled from the party. Contrast that with somebody like Jackie Walker, who said that the Jews were the chief financiers of the slave trade, and it's taken three years to expel her over that. We've got countless other people who are either suspended and then readmitted into the party or languishing whilst Labour dithers over disciplinary processes for years. And you see how the scale of the problem. So was Alistair Campbell removed specially to distract from the issue? Only I, could, uh, I can't look into the, uh, the, sort of the minds and hearts of Seamus Milne and the various spin doctors behind Jeremy Corbyn. Sorry, Williams, you can because you used to work with him. What, Seamus? Yes. Um... I mean, look, I, I've given up trying to guess what Seamus is thinking a long time ago. It's, it's, it's really... You, I, I really don't understand. There are, there are kind of a couple of things I do understand. Um, one of them... I don't know if it was... A, I don't think it was a cynical ploy to distra- distract because I don't think they're that focused on where the attention is. And I think that's part of the problem. They've got this... Somebody said, you know, at the very beginning of Corbyn's leadership, the problem... Whatever you think of Jeremy Corbyn, the problem is the way people win is the way they think is the only way they think they can win and the way Corbyn won originally was by completely ignoring what the media were saying, completely ignoring criticism, completely ignoring this kind of onslaught of you know, um, you can call it attack, you can call it criticism, you can call it whatever you like but he completely ignored it, got his head down won and the problem is they're still doing that so they can't hear it anything they hear that's wrong with them they just put down to a far right conspiracy or a right wing conspiracy or a centrist dad conspiracy or a conspiracy of some sort and then they that I think makes them react in this very kind of splenetic way so you know whatever the motivation behind expelling Alice Campbell was and I completely see the, I can completely see the point he's been actively dissing Jeremy Corbyn constantly well that's not why they no 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 him, but it? you know I can see that there was a kind of there was a long history of animus and also I don't think him delivering Blair's electoral success would cut much ice with any of them but the reason they expelled him is because they've got this kind of really hard core of um, bunker mentality where you know as long as you've kind of made it clear that you're that you've you've identified your enemies it kind of doesn't matter what what it looks like to a spectator and i think that is a real problem in the heart of the party so you don't think it was a deflection tactic because of course if this had been in the blair era Everyone would say, oh, trying to bury bad news. But that's because they? Tony Blair actually listened to bad news, right? So he listened, he was very reactive, too reactive, I thought, to the Daily Mail, too reactive to the tabloids. He was, he was a reactive Prime Minister. Um, Jeremy Corbyn doesn't react to anything. So he'll look at the HRC. Um, investigation and he'll have people lined up to say oh this is yet another conspiracy against Jeremy Corbyn that won't influence what his next move is but I think his next move is influenced by just as negative a thing which is you know always be on the attack I just don't think look I live in Kate Hoey's constituency she as far as I'm concerned campaigned alongside Nigel Farage if you can if you can't expel her and then you want to expel Alistair Campbell that just that's just ridiculous. Well, people often accuse Seamus Miller of being a Stalinist. It's about time we had a few purges, isn't it? <laughs> um, Siobhan. 
Well, the first thing I would like to say, obviously, is thank you to Alistair Campbell for lending his vote to the Liberal Democrats because <laughs> he wasn't the only person to do that. But on a, on a more serious note, I mean, anyone that knows Alistair Campbell just knows how much he cares about the Labour Party and he is Labour through and through. So that wasn't an easy decision for him to make. I totally agree with what Zoe's saying, that I think the decision to expel him, it might, it might be a distraction technique, I'm not sure, but actually what it shows more than anything is the Labour leadership is so out of touch, not only with the public mood now, you only have to look on Twitter to see the kind of expel me now to movement or whatever that's going on, you know, they're out of touch with the public uh, mood, but they're out of touch with their own MPs, they're out of touch, I think, with their own members now, and they are in a kind of bunker mentality, they're not listening to anybody and I think they are going exactly the same way as the Conservative Party and both main parties are imploding. They are fighting internal battles and they are completely, completely not listening to what the public want. Steve Norris. Well, for what it's worth, a former Deputy Prime Minister of the Conservative Party was expelled for uh, saying... Who is making a speech as we speak, warning the Conservative Party that it's about to be taken over by pseudo farages uh, Absolutely. And uh, I remember Anna Subri making much the same comment herself. I think your original questioner posed a, a, a perfectly serious proposition, which is that somehow this was part of an exercise to deflect. And I think Zoe kind of dispensed with that, and I think you don't have to add a lot to the strange mentality that goes on in the Corbyn bunker. If he did think it was going to distract, then I think he's seriously missed the point. I doubt whether he would have even known I, about exactly, the decision, would he? Precisely. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and, you know, I think the, 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 the HRC's investigation is an infinitely more serious proposition. I don't think that Labour is going to be able to escape from that. You know, both parties have their issues there. The Tories with elements of uh, Islamophobia and um, Labour with its mm -hmm. really deeply embedded problem with uh, anti-Semitism. But I think the more interesting issue is the one in a sense that Siobhan's just raised, which is whether this isn't evidence of a fracturing of the current political system because one thing is very clear that um, certainly in my many many decades in in politics i've never seen as you've never seen a situation in which the parties are internally as fractured as they are it's uh, odd, isn't it? Because in, in the 2017 election, was it 85% of us voted for the two main parties? In the last two years, everything's different. But yeah. of course, yeah. European elections, are very, and I'm sure we'll get questions on this, but European elections are um, very difficult to draw a huge amount of lessons from in normal circumstances. Well, that, I'm very glad you said that because, I mean, I do think it's really... I, I completely, completely understand that parties who were seen to have done well out of the election, Lib Dems, of course, particularly, are going to claim that this is a great seminal moment. I think what was really interesting was that research that um, I think Mori did. I may be giving them credit they don't deserve, but one of the leading uh, polling agencies did, which said, um, which asked people, which of the parties do you think will survive? This is the same polling exercise in which they determined already that the Greens were likely to outpoll the Tories, you know, mm -hmm. which should have meant, surely, you know, if that meant anything, that the Tories were absolutely finished and so was mm -hmm. Labour. What was interesting is when they were asked, who, which of these parties are going to survive? The answer was, number one, the Conservatives, number two, Labour, number three, the Lib Dems, number four, the Greens, number five, Scottish Nationalists, and so on. And the parties that were not going to survive, uh, Brexit, UKIP, Change UK, you know, et al. And, and I think that not to understand just what this European election was all around um, and to conflate that into something wider around how, you know, the fundamental shift in UK politics is, is happening is, I think, perhaps a little wider than mine. Let's go back to our questioner. Graham, what's your view? Do you think it was deliberate or just coincidence? I think it was a mixture. I think that there was probably a deliberate ploy by Labour to try and bury bad news, knowing that uh, the HRC investigation is, would be a bigger news story. So maybe they thought, let's get the Alistair Campbell thing out the way and get that into the, uh, the bigger story to deflect it. But the other side could be, was it maybe Alistair Campbell that was trying to protect the Labour Party by releasing uh, the email that he got yesterday rather than waiting a bit? 
Oh, I, I, I think yeah. that's a conspiracy too far, isn't it? I mean, normally these things are cock up rather than conspiracies. And I, I can't really imagine. Even Alistair Campbell, I can't imagine being that macky. Well, well, the on thing the other is, hand, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think this is where it was, sorry, Gideon. Th- this is where we go on the, the bunker mentality issue, because I think you know, to, th- th- you know, is it incompetence or is it is it some kind of devious plan? And the idea that there's this sort of bunker mentality, I think it's true. I think within the Labour team, there is a bunker mentality. They see anything... Which is understandable, actually, well, isn't it? Well, it's, it, it would be understandable if they didn't deserve it, but they deserve it, I think, you know, with, <laughs> with anti-Semitism for certain. And I think what we're seeing, the, the thing that convinced me that there was this real malevolence going on within the, within the Labour team was when we saw the Shami Chakrabarti investigation into anti-Semitism in mm-hmm. 2016, because we've, we've seen this all before. Back in 2017, 2016, Ken Livingston was was out saying that Hitler was supporting Zionism, and all of all of this was going on. And in the midst of that, the the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn says, "We're going to ask Shami Chakrabarti to investigate and and turn you know leave, leave no stone unturned. She's going to investigate anti-Semitism for us." And she comes out with this report. In the first sentence of which she says, "The Labour Party doesn't have a problem with anti-Semitism," which will be. To, to, to her dying day, her shame and disgrace. But what we also then see is that Jeremy Corbyn, who thinks that the House of Lords should be abolished, then makes the first ever recommendation that he's made for someone to be appointed to the House of Lords, and Shami Chakrabarti becomes Baroness Chakrabarti. Sorry. That, that to me, speaks of a malevolence, not just a bunker mentality. You see, I, I, am I allowed to go back a little bit, bef- a little bit pre Corbyn's leadership I'm into sorry the anti Semitism? Don't take too long about no, it. No, I promise I'll be really, really fast. <laughs> I just remember this from, you know, I remember it from the eighties, and I also remember it from that Margaret McDonald chapter I did for your female MPs book. The Labour Party has a problem with the way it discusses Israel. And I think that problem is, and, and this is like a real old war horse story. They they talk about it like it's a colonial power. They talk about it like they're demonstrating their hatred of colonialism via this extant colonial force, completely ignoring the fact that Israel is a colonial power, has nothing in common with the British Empire or any other empire, that, you know, whatever whatever the rights and wrongs of the situation, you, you cannot absolve yourself of kind of colonial guilt, if you have it, by make, taking these postures on Israel and Palestine. So fine, fine, fine to have a, a stance on Palestine, to, have, to, to fight for Palestine, that's absolutely fine. But Labour historically has had this position where they try and ventriloquise what a brilliant anti-colonial lefty they are by finding this kind of extant colonialism left in the world. And it is really alienating and and really it's something they could really work on if they were prepared to look at it but as soon as anybody says can you work on this you get this kind of complete shutdown mm. no i cannot work on this you're against the palestinians which you're which you know you're that's not what you're saying <laughs> but you know I, I and i look at and i and i think the problem with that is that jeremy corbyn is too associated with that kind of real old god because it is a real old god thing you don't get much youth anti-semitism in the labor party and he's too associated with them and he's not stepping back okay and, yeah Siobhan. Yeah, I was going to say, so I think the, the, the Labour Party have loads of problems at the moment, but actually it comes back to identity. What what does it mean to be a kind of Labour Party member or a Labour supporter? And actually, when I was growing up, my parents always voted Labour. Um, and the one thing that I could be sure of is that Labour were against racism. They were mm. pro-immigrant. You know, yeah, they would yeah, have yeah. been rooting for freedom yeah. of movement. And actually, where has that gone? I couldn't tell you now what the Labour Party stood for. And I think they have a real crisis of identity and that's why you're seeing their support just bleeding away from them because they aren't the old guard anymore not my old guard yeah, anyway yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't think people actually know what the Labour Party is anymore. I think the immigration thing is it is a very strong and separate issue it is it's been absolutely shocking for the Labour hardcore to watch them messing about with freedom of yeah. movement and not standing up for EU EU residents and not doing anything to, to fight racism. Absolutely, it's and that's where the Lib shocking. Dems, that's why we have actually managed to attract so many votes from from the Labour Party, because we've proudly been saying that we are, we believe in the benefits of immigration. We've supported okay. EU citizens from the start. We will move on. Uh, 0345 6060 973 if you'd like to ask a question to our panel. Remarkable lack of questions so far on the European elections, which I would have thought that would be dominating but uh, you never know
Sorry, sorry? Maybe they'll think we'll all agree and then that will be boring. Well, the remarkable thing about the first 17 minutes is that I've agreed with everything you've said so far. That (laughs) doesn't happen very often. Yeah, but we had a massive fight about elephants earlier in the day, so I think we're fine. We did, actually, didn't we? I'm sure Uh, we can disagree on who won the election, Ian. uh, Oh, I think we probably could. (laughs) It's 17 minutes past eight. This is LBC. Reunite with thousands of free kids' places when you book a TUI holiday now. With great offers on destinations from Mallorca to Mykonos. Book online or visit your local TUI store. We cross the T's, dot the I's and put you in the middle. TUI. Discover your smile. At all protected. Free kids' places subject to limited availability on selected holidays for a limited time. One free child place per two full paying adults. Booking T's and C's apply. See website for details. quality kitchen you've dreamed of at a price well within your budget. That's Room Sense. That's Room Sense. This month, all kitchens are half price with a free oven hob and extractor. Book your free home design visit today at roomsense.co.uk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quality at a price you can afford. That's Room Sense. Offer ends soon. Minimum spend applies. Right now at Vodafone, enjoy four times more data on the brilliant iPhone XR and other pay monthly phones. Get more tunes pumping, more FaceTimes rolling, more apps tapping, maps mapping, emojis emojiing, and more box set binging in stunning HD. That's four times more data with 60 gig for the price of 15 on a range of pay monthly phones, including the brilliant iPhone XR. Hurry, offer ends 3rd of June. The future's exciting. Ready? Vodafone. For terms and exclusions, see vodafone.co.uk. How refreshing is it to know that when you're thinking about remortgaging, you can find out if you could borrow what you need straight away without affecting your credit score. That's why at Barclays, we'll let you know with an online agreement in principle from the comfort of your own home. We're refreshing and reshaping the way we do mortgages to make them easier. Search Barclays Mortgages. Let's go forward. T's and C's apply. Spotted this week at Lidl, XXL week. Get a 1kg pack of Milbona Gouda slices for only 3 69 A 500 gram pack of Chef Select Noki, just 1 59 And a 960 gram pack of Crownfield Wheat Biscuits for only 1 99 Huge offers, tiny prices. From Thursday the 23rd of May. Subject to availability, selected stores excludes NI. <laughs> okay, guys, as promised, here's my signature Caprizi salad with fresh Galabrani mozzarella. Ooh. In Italy? We say Galbani. Yeah, Galbani. Topped with fresh basil and drizzled with a perfect balsamic dressing. Mwah. No, no, no. It's Galbani. <laughs> Galbani mozzarella. Well, that's what I said. Galbani. 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 Oh, my Galbani. For proper Italian mozzarella, it's got to be Galbani. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 20 minutes past eight on LBC. You're listening to Cross Question. Don't forget, you can watch us on the LBC website, lbc.co.uk, Facebook, or our Twitter feed. Steve Norris is here, former Conservative Minister, Siobhan Benita, who is Liberal Democrat candidate for London Mayor. Uh, How is it different being a a party candidate from running as an independent? Um, In some ways, it's harder because when I was running as an independent, the only person that I could let down was myself. And there was quite a nice freedom to that, actually. So I'm very conscious that I'm now representing a party and I want to do my absolute best for them. But equally, it's really nice to have a team behind me as well. And at the moment, it's the kind of bubbliest, most energetic, upbeat team so um, around. Steve kind of ran moment. as an independent anyway, didn't you, Steve? Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> I mean, but my view was, uh, you know, if you ask my party leader and I'm supposed to do what he says, then why don't you elect him rather than me? I just always felt the job yeah. of the mayor of London is to care about London and to be prepared to be critical of the party in power, even if it's your own. And we have two more independent-minded people with us as well, Zoe Williams, Guardian columnist and Gideon Falter from the campaign against anti-Semitism. 0345 973 Let's take some more of your questions. Shuvik is in Orpington. Hello, Shuvik. Uh, hello there, Ian. Um, Hi. Uh, um, yeah, my, uh, um, on, on the, um, the um, Israel-Palestinian issue, um, the Liberals, Liberal Democrats have an MP, Leila Moran, and presumably she is also opposed to the move um, to the US, um, I thought the you United wanted States to ask US about Donald Trump. To Jerusalem. Um, um, so it's not only the Labour Party... Yeah, well, can you get to your question, Israel. which I gather was on Donald Trump? Yes, it is. Good. 
Um, what is the panel's response to um, um, the, the, um, the findings of the Robert Mueller investigation? Um, should the state visit of Donald Trump to the United Kingdom go ahead? Well, so basically, I guess Juvie is really saying, should it be cancelled in the light of what Robert Mueller has said today? Um, Siobhan? Well, I don't think the state visit should ever have uh, be going ahead in the first place. Actually, I don't think I don't think Trump deserves a state visit. Um, but I don't think the um, Mueller announcement today makes much difference. Really, I think he said that there wasn't. If I've understood it correctly, because the story was just coming out this afternoon, what he said is there wasn't enough evidence for him to say that Trump wasn't innocent. But neither has he said anything more than we knew already about... I think um, he's, he's gone a little bit further, has he? Now, hasn't he? I think he, he's basically implied that if he was anyone else but the President of the United States, he would be facing charges. Yeah, I, I just think a lot of people will say, well, you should just have come out then and said it. So I think it still leaves it kind of a bit unclear. But my point remains that I don't think we should be giving Trump a state visit anyway. If I were the Mayor of London, I certainly wouldn't be attending that state visit. I know that for diplomatic reasons, we host all sorts of people. We don't necessarily agree with their views but there has to be a limit and I think Trump has crossed that limit by far um, he's a misogynist he's racist he's you know he said awful things about disabled people I just don't think we should be giving him he doesn't deserve that respect and I think it puts what, the Queen what, in a really difficult position. What about position. the point that we hosted a visit for the Chinese president which your party leader I think went to Jeremy Corbyn went to and he has concentration camps for Muslims. I don't think Vince did go I, I, I'd have to check that I don't think he did um, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that that was right either. I think but it's a didn't, relatively uh, but new... But people didn't at the time, did they? Everyone accepted that uh, it was quite right to invite the Chinese president because we want their money. Uh, well, and yet people have a real objection to a democratically elected president, awful though he may be on a personal level. Yeah, you... but you say everyone, but I'm giving, you know, I'm saying I think it's a relatively modern phenomena that we give state visits the way that we do now to, to all kinds of leaders. Steve Norris. It's just not a modern phenomenon. It's a very, very long established phenomenon. President Ceausescu. Absolutely. I was going to mention Ceausescu, fairly enough, alongside, as you say, Xi Jinping and one or two other Mugabe. deeply unpleasant people. Mugabe, these people are murderers. These people imprison their political opponents. They lock them up. They put them into concentration camps. They do far worse to them than that. Trump is a loathsome human being uh, on every level that I don't think one can possibly deny. But he is the office of the President of the United States of America, uh, Europe's strongest supporter and ally. And therefore, I think, you know, this is, uh, this is a question of holding your nose and giving him a state visit because it's important that we retain a relationship not just with the United States, but with the people of the United States. You know, one of the issues around American politics is that, you know, when Bill Clinton was having his tough time, you didn't want to criticize him in front of Americans of whether they were Republicans or Democrats because he is their, you know, he's their head of state. And I mean, yeah, I think I, God knows why, you know, Trump ever got through the Republican candidates to become the candidate for president. And God knows why he got enough votes to win when he is such an intolerable human mm. being. But he's the president. Sorry. Um, look, there is an important difference, isn't there? Which is that. I suspect this is the point where you and I are going to disagree, isn't I it? I don't, I mean, probably, yeah. Well, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Wait till I get to my Wait. next bit. <laughs> <laughs> then you're going to kick me out. Um, there is an important difference. And I think the difference is that Xi Jinping, for example, you're kind of trying to bring... There is, an, there is a sense in which when you, when you invite a, a, the president of China over, you're trying to kind of bring two cultures which are quite different in the way they kind of execute government closer well, execute to and they're, and they're, being, of course the appropriate word <laughs> but you know the the point about china i suppose it's is that the long term direction is more democracy i mean it's not it's not going fast enough it's not done enough but it's the long term direction is more democracy whereas trump is very deliberately going towards less democracy, you know, imprisoning children, separating mm. them from their parents. 38,000 ch migrant children still separated from their parents. Committing human rights abuses from a standpoint of, you know, a modern social democracy. And I think that is quite scary. And I think you should be able, as a, as a mature democracy, to say, 
okay, we can't be completely blameless and blemish-free in all our international dealings, but we will take a stand against people who are taking a mature democracy back to the Dark Ages. So I do think that's a difference. The other thing is, wait a sec, it's a really bad time for the Tory party, right? Because President Trump does not have the manners to Mm. treat Theresa May like anything but Mm. a dead duck. So he's going to be doing terrible things. You he's going to be. You can just well. hear the phrase "poor Teresa" yeah, coming yeah, out yeah, of his yeah, mouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh God, yes, I, I expect it. And um, he'll probably also say, "My friend Boris." Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's yeah, probably going to hold meetings with Gid- Boris. Gideon. I, I mean, look, I, I agree to some extent. I, when, when the when the question came through, I thought it was going to be on my specialist subject, but uh, <laughs> they changed to Robert Mueller and Trump. I mean, all, all I can say is <laughs> that, luck. yeah, I, look, I I hope that when the Equality and Human Rights Commission reports, it's a lot clearer than Robert Mueller has been uh, in in his report. And I, I just think, look, you know, with state visits, it's always a very difficult one to call. But we've had people like Bashar Assad come exactly. and, and you know, spend yeah. time at Buckingham Palace. I mean, in fact, Jeremy yeah. Corbyn uh, went, went and visited him uh, in, in Syria. So, you know, you, But that was before the Civil War, right? He was still yeah, pretty no, awful back so. then. He no, was no, still... no, he, was, he wasn't great. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, no, it's you have to put it in context. I, I just want to say, you know, we can list all of the people that we've invited and given state visits to in the past, but actually that was the past. I, I joined kind of the party, the Liberal Democrat Party, two, two years ago, so after referendum. And I'm saying we might, we've made lots of mistakes in the past and now is the moment where people are saying enough's enough. You have to stand up for your values. And that's why I think the Brexit Party and the Lib Dems, we are surging in the polls because we might have completely different values, but we're very clear on what our values are. And for me, this is a moment to say, no, we don't want somebody like Trump to come over here. He doesn't share our values. If he comes over for diplomatic reasons, we have him as a visit that's fine but we don't give him the respect of a state visit and i'm i'm okay. i just think people but, are but you're equally not being respectful e- you're not equally not being respectful to the literally you know tens of millions of americans who voted for this guy you know and I, yeah, none of Stephen, us disagrees what a repulsive end? well i'll tell you where i think it ends uh, uh, the, the interesting thing about the question was that it conflated Mueller with trump's right, visit right, right, right. and the irony is that this is how democracies do work there is a process by which the president of the united states can be investigated but that, but actually... and, and you know we'll have things said about him which are deeply um, unflattering let's put it no but, less than that but that's not right is it because Mueller has said kind of implicitly that if he were anyone but the president he would yeah, be uh, he I would think... be under indictment and so the office of the presidency is protecting him well, here, from criminal charges here's, a, here's well, a different view from Zach sorry. on an email he says as someone who lives in Portsmouth the city the president will be visiting because of the D-Day yeah, commemorations quite. I'm proud to play host to the president of the United States <laughs> states regardless of who he or she is and the type of character they are i respect the office the president holds and who they represent so much so that tomorrow i plan on decorating my entire building with american (laughs) american bunting and a star and stripes flying from a 30-foot flagpole well (laughs) done (laughs) no but i mean i think you know respecting the office um and accepting that the person individually may be a deeply unpleasant person and indeed taking zoe's point which is you could argue that some of the things he's done have been you know a real shock to american well, democracy well he, he should start by respecting the office himself then and he should act ah, in an appropriate please, please way please don't, as please a don't be put leader. in the position of being a defender of donald trump <laughs> what we're talking about That's here job, is friend. a state visit <laughs> by the the head of state of our most important ally of one of the greatest world democracies where presidents can be indicted, where presidents can be removed from office, and where President Trump may or may not win the next uh, next uh, presidential election. Right, we are going to move on to another subject in a few moments' time. 0345 6060973, if you'd like to ask my panel a question. It's 8.31, time for the news headlines with Serena Farrow. Donald Trump's insisting the case is closed over questions about his election campaign and Russian interference. US Special Counsel Robert Mueller said charging the president with a crime was wasn't an option because of Justice Department guidelines. 
Conservative leadership contender Boris Johnson has been ordered to appear in court accused of lying. It follows comments he made in the Brexit referendum. Claims that the UK sent £350 million a week to the EU were plastered all over a red bus during the 2016 campaign. And an inquest has heard the terrorists behind the London Bridge attack may not have been originally targeting the area. A phone found in their van had directions instead to Oxford Street. LBC where the rain continuing in the north of England this evening, drier and milder elsewhere though, with a low of 8 degrees. This is LBC. Sheila Fogarty, Monday to Friday from 1pm. Did anyone call the police at this point? Yeah, I'm your little ones upstairs and called the police. And the police still haven't arrived? Police haven't arrived. They got prosecuted for it. The day after when I looked at what had happened, there were screwdrivers on the path that he'd obviously been throwing out his pockets. And I'm glad you're OK and on your side because you're not the man breaking into people's property. But why did you drag him into your house? Sheila Fogarty. With Blink, an Amazon company, helping give your family peace of mind. LBC. Reunite and save up to £300 per couple when you book a TUI holiday now. With great offers on destinations from Mallorca to Mykonos. Book online or visit your local TUI store. We cross the T's, dot the I's and put you in the middle. TUI. Discover your smile. At all protected. Offer available on selected holidays for a limited time and subject to availability. Booking T's and C's apply. See website for details. If you're caring for a person with dementia or you're a care professional, don't miss the Alzheimer's show at Olympia on June the 7th and 8th. It's your chance to discover the latest products and services, hear expert speakers and learn new ways to help those with dementia. Tickets are available on the door or online from alzheimershow.co.uk. You can complain free to your lender or the financial ombudsman about missold PPI. Alternatively, if you haven't got the time or the inclination, then just get the claims guys to manage the claims process for you. With the August 29th deadline approaching times at a premium anyway. So if you can't find your paperwork or you're not even sure you have PPI, it's definitely time to make a decision and start your PPI claim before it's too late. Text ANSWER to 6677. Text ANSWER to 6677 now. The Claims Guys. Word in the woods is that three little pigs are looking to sell their homes quick. They seem to be in a spot of bother with the big bad wolf called Rick. Come out, come out, little piggies. So they spoke to the friendly team at Property Rescue, who can offer a guaranteed sale in as little as 48 hours at a fair price and a cash advance if you need one. Fast forward to living happily ever after. Visit propertyrescue.co.uk. Property Rescue. Fast forward to sold. Hey, Jürgen, I'm defo betting on corners this game. <sighs> How many? Four. Look, the pitch is rectangular. Don't bet silly. Bet savvy. New Coral customers can get £20 in free bets when they bet on any sport. The smart money's on Coral. 18 plus online, min odds 1 to 2, must be placed within 14 days of registration. Pay pounds, certain deposit types excluded. Free bet value for seven days. State not returned. Full terms at coral.co.uk. When the fun stops, stop. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 25 to 9 here on LBC. Steve Norris, Siobhan Benita, Zoe Williams, Gideon Falter with me to take your questions. Mike is in Hounslow. Hi, Mike. Hello there. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hiya. Um, it was a question that I had, really, was, was to do with the, the European elections that we had last week. Of course, everybody's going on that. about having a... Uh, <laughs> well, everybody's going on about having a second referendum, but as far as I'm concerned, I think we've, we've just had one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I thought that, you know... That, that the only people who want a second referendum, Mike, are the people who didn't win the first time round. Yeah, but the <laughs> it, it's just been re, it's, it's, it's just been reinforced, hasn't it? So, so what's, what's your question? Well, the question is, why do we need a second re referendum if we just had one? Can okay. I can I answer that? Uh, I'm sure you're going to, whether I let you or not. Because <laughs> I've been a hard second referendumer since the 24th of June, and this is why the original vote was held on a promise that had no meat on its bones. Now, the meat could have been good it mm. still could be good but it had no meat on its bones so just like any agreement you always would have had to go back to the country and say when when you voted for this is this what you had in mind i thought today it came to me like a flash of lightning the way to resolve this is you have a second you have a confirmatory vote and you don't even let remainers vote in it you just That'd say be really good only yeah, leavers are allowed to vote if that if that's what you wanted is this what you meant 
<laughs> and then see what happens because I don't know we've got and the situation and if they say no leave under no deal if they say if they yeah, say no quiet. they say no if they say yes they say yes they, it wouldn't be up to them what the solution was once they'd rejected the deal but why not only let them vote because we're getting to a point where it's so leavers are really dug in on no second vote as though it's a point of principle that you can't have another vote on a completely amorphous proposition and remainers are completely dug in on second vote as though it's a, a foregone conclusion that the second time they'll win will win but neither of those positions is is rational you have to say this was a very big baggy unclear proposition is this what you wanted Steve Norris. Well, I, I, I just re repeat what I said earlier, which is that, in, as far as I can tell, people asking for a second round of a people, referendum of people who didn't get the right answer the first time round. No, but come and, on, take and, my point, though. Yeah, I will take your point, because it's a very serious one. And what's more, it, it has some real uh, sense behind it in that what has certainly happened since that vote is that a process that many of us believe ought to have been significantly more straightforward um, shorter and arrived at a conclusion which would have benefited both sides equally or disbenefited both sides equally nobody's suggesting that the 27 and the UK don't continue to want to trade with each other bilaterally they sell more to us than we sell to them we sell services and you know manufactured goods they sell food which rots on the dock if it's left too long so you know however this was to organize it was about being passionately pro-european and really doubting the validity of the organization now called the European Union. That's certainly why I, for example, voted leave and would again, uh, given, given that choice. I, I think the point about the second referendum is that 17.4 million people are entitled to say, you know, we uh, were asked, we answered, a million more of us voted to leave than voted to remain, and a Remain Parliament has decided that that is not a proposition they want to agree to. I mean, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, if uh, you know people are arguing for a second referendum, what they're really trying to do is to overturn the, the result of the first. That will be what people think. Your rational point, I agree, has some merit, but I don't think actually that we need look any further than the European elections. Okay, Gideon. I think one obviously to some extent the the election going back to the question was a second referendum people who put an x in the box next to the Brexit party had one thing on their mind we can be pretty sure of that but I think it was also a referendum about the state of politics and I think that's also something we need to look at because mm -hmm. people who voted for example green and lib dems in numbers that they've never done before I think were passing a verdict on where they felt their home had moved to within the left of British politics. I think there was a, there was a real vote of disappointment with the Labour Party. There was a real vote of disappointment with the Conservative Party. So I think to some extent the, the, the elections were about Brexit. But I think to almost as much of an extent, I think you know th this was a vote in which to many people's minds it's a, it's a, it's a safe protest vote. If you vote in somebody you don't really like, they're not really going to have much influence over your life from the European Parliament. So it's a safe protest vote. And in that safe protest vote, people were very clear that they were rejecting the main two parties. I think there's massive disappointment out there. I think, you know, go, that, to, to some extent, you know, looking at that election, I think you've got to look at it as a real warning sign that the British public has completely lost faith in the political system. And we know from history that when that happens, you're in a very critically dangerous point. So I think it's more than just about Brexit. I think there are a whole plethora of issues now which the main parties have failed on and which the, the public well, has... I don't know how you voted in the referendum. Feel free to tell us if you want to. But do you think there ought to be another one? Personally, um, no. I, I think that once you, you know, I remember getting that booklet that came through the door, <laughs> and it said that we will implement whatever you vote on. And I think that if you make a promise to the public like that, even if you didn't define it properly, even if you weren't clear on what the repercussions would be, would be maybe if you, even if you didn't know what the repercussions would be, if you make a promise, you've got to keep it. Yeah, but Sh no, hang on, Sorry. Siobhan. Okay, so going back to what the caller said, have we just had a second? Not quite the Zoe William show yet. Have we just had a second? <laughs> have we just had a second referendum? Um, if you look at the results of the EU elections, I think um, one thing is very clear: there were two parties, the Brexit Party and UKIP, who were hard Brexit. They were actually putting forward a No Deal Brexit. Then there were a group of parties, the Lib Dems being the strongest one, who were arguing for a People's Vote 
and they want to stay in the European Union. We were very clear about that. We weren't ambiguous. We want a people's vote because we want to stay in the European Union because we think Brexit is going to be bad. When you take those two blocks, the biggest block was the people who voted to stay in the European Union. So if that was a second You've referendum... ignored um, the Conservative no, and this Labour comes voters. Well, this comes back to then the point around... Um, we can't just say we had a referendum already and people voted to leave. We do not know... 70% what turnout, incidentally, whereas the turnout in the European election was... Yeah, but what 39, kind of... 39. Fine, but in the same way that we can't actually say with clarity what people were voting for when they voted Labour or Conservative in the EU elections, we can't say what type of Brexit people were voting yes, for we in the first it referendum. It was just to leave the European Union, well, simple that as that. That doesn't mean it's anything, not, Ian. Of course it, it does. Mean of course anything. it does. Well, does, it it does it mean leave with no deal? Does it mean leave with Theresa May's deal? It means deal? leave. It does means it mean leave. leave? If you can't leave with a deal, you leave, leave with no deal. Leave, leave, leave means leave. It's the same as Brexit means Brexit. It is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. It's very straightforward. What we it couldn't okay. be clearer. If it's that straightforward, yeah. tell me what that amazing deal is that nobody has yet managed to articulate. Put that back to the people and say, is this what you meant yeah, when think, you voted in the first referendum? I think there's an aspect More democracy of the, can't yeah. undermine democracy. Yeah. And I don't know what 17 million people will then be afraid of. Uh, I was just going to make a point, which is that, you know, in, in a sense, we could argue endlessly about who won in inverted commas, you know, oh, believe frankly. Believe me, we have. And you have. <laughs> and no doubt uh, radio stations across the country would be doing exactly the same. I just want to make one point about... Brexit, this party that emerged, you know, actually, I think later even than Change UK and yet managed to <laughs> sweep the board, you know, in terms of seats. I was pretty clear that that was a huge number of Tory voters who were actually saying to Theresa May, be gone. You know, she managed to <laughs> preempt it. Gone. She managed to preempt it by a matter of hours. Yeah. But the massive frustration in Conservative ranks about the way that the whole negotiation has been handled from day one was what I think led to the massive support for a Farage party. But and actually, you know, on the more interesting issue about whether our politics are fundamentally broken, just think back to what happened in 2015 when UKIP got, what was it, 15% of the vote. And then in 2017, after the referendum, when UKIP mm. effectively disappeared. And I do think what, one? that both Respect and Change UK, and dare I say quite a lot of that Liberal vote, will disappear when we one, get round one, to a one general One question election. that I think people who are in favour of a second referendum can never answer is, what would it actually solve? Because if you go from the premise that the polls and this Euro these European elections... Yeah. Sorry, I'm what a presenter, <laughs> Just let, let, me, let me ask you this question. Um, if, if we sh think the polls are still roughly where they were, the, the election results show roughly 50-50 split, leave, remain. I mean, I know you say hard Brexit and all the rest of it, but it's still 50-50. In that case, what does a referendum resolve? Because you're going to get roughly the same result. Well, A, the, actually what the polls are showing is 58% remain and... Well, it depends which polls oh. and what question you ask, isn't it? It's been a year. You asked me what, I, polls, what I thought it would yeah. solve. I'm telling you what I think it's going to solve, right? So the polls are actually 58% remain and that is before any campaign has been fought. So if you had the Labour Party on the front foot saying we will re remain and reform Europe, we will fix Britain instead and we will make sure, God damn it, that you never have to have this tedious conversation ever again. I swear to God it would go up to 70-30. I have absolute yeah. confidence in that. Secondly, <laughs> secondly, then this is a really weird thing that like you see a lot on Twitter, and maybe I spend too much time on Twitter. But everybody's like, oh, you know, the Brexit party was the largest. Of course, if you can if you combine the Lib Dems and the Greens, you get this, but what if you put these people over here? You it you know, yeah. you saw losers. Why do you have to combine all these parties to make your point? Now it's like it's fine to it's fine to act like that but you have to if you were thinking responsibly and maturely about being in government or being anywhere near government you would think those people are still going to exist whether you railroad them with a no deal whether you find some shenanigan and you know spin them up in a knot those people still exist and those people will still exist after you have your no deal they will still exist after your medicines have run out they will still exist after your food mm. has gone through the roof and your job okay. is gone no. and this is you know right. you will have to answer to them uh, the final word goes to an anonymous texter who says what do these dumb nuts not understand about leave <laughs> quite <laughs> i'll leave that one hanging uh, we'll come to more of your questions in a moment oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three it's eight forty six 
Nick Ferrari at breakfast. LBC. Is a no-deal Brexit political suicide? Health Secretary Matt Hancock. I simply don't think that it is a policy choice that's available to the next Prime Minister. I don't think that the House of Commons will allow a no-deal Brexit. What we've got to do to get to deliver Brexit is to be honest about the hurdles that are in place. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. With Zero, Get your business digital ready with Zero accounting software. LBC. The real reason Sleeping Beauty fell asleep was because it was taking so long for the palace to sell and the handsome prince needed the proceeds to buy their new home with no time to dwell. I know who can help! Property Rescue! I'll contact them straight away! So he spoke to their friendly team who took care of every detail. They bought the palace direct with no legal fees to pay. Fast forward to living happily ever after. Visit propertyrescue.co.uk Property Rescue. Fast forward to solve. Would you and your business benefit from a personal approach from your accountant? At Barnes Rofe, of course our partners have the technical skills needed to offer you first-class audit, tax and accounting advice. But most importantly, we'll work closely with you to help your business grow long-term. Perhaps it's time to see what we can do for you. Arrange your free consultation at barnesrofe.com. Barnes Rofe. Clever accountants for business. At the AA, we're always trying to make your journey better. Our mechanics fix 8 out of 10 cars at the roadside, usually within 30 minutes of arriving. You could say we're simply the best. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong song. Join today from just £4.50 a month. Visit theaa.com. The AA, because anything can happen. New customers only. T's and C's apply. Unlock the city with the new Range Rover Evoque. Know your... From your... Know your side streets. From your inner city beats. Know your underbelly. And where to fill your belly. Your lamb, madam. Know your north. From your south. Live for the city with the new Range Rover Evoque. Land Rover, above and beyond. So, what's everyone got for lunch then? Just a sandwich. Yeah, I've got the same boring sandwiches yesterday. Oh, what have you got? Ah, a refreshingly smooth Costa ice latte, a tasty mozzarella and sun-dried tomato pasta salad, and a bag of fancy hand-cooked crisps. Why have the same thing every day? Pop into Costa Coffee for lunch and pick up your favourite hot or iced coffee with our delicious lunch deal, just £4.95. Costa's lunch deal available between 11 and 2. Visit costa.co.uk for full terms and participating stores. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. It's uh, 11 minutes to 8 here on LBC. Steve Norris, Siobhan Benita, Zoe Williams and Gideon Falter are here. You can watch us on Facebook, the LBC website or our Twitter feed. Um, let's take a text question from Philip in Richmond who says, with so many candidates running for the Tory leadership, aside from whether you like the Conservatives, <laughs> who would you choose if you had a vote out of the declared candidates? Well, there are, I think, 11 declared candidates so far. I'll be interviewing them all in the week start, or the two weeks starting June the 10th, one after the other. Um, Gideon, what was I'll have to watch your interviews first. Oh, no, 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 you're no. not getting out of it that quickly. <laughs> you know who they all are. Um, who do you... All right, well, let's put it this way. Who do you think is most likely to win the Tories in election? Well, according to the, to the received wisdom, it's Boris. But when you look at what Boris has done and said over the years, it's, it's very difficult to see Boris surviving a, a campaign. I mean, wh whenever somebody confronts him with the things that he said... He doesn't seem to do very well at explaining why it is that he thought it was acceptable to use the language he's used uh, and some of the incidents he's been involved with. So it, it, it seems to me that uh, Boris, though he may be the front runner, might well not survive a, an election campaign. And if he doesn't? If he doesn't, well, who, I mean, which of the other remaining 10 might get through? I have no idea. Siobhan. So I would have to back one of the candidates who said that you can't have a no deal scenario. And I'm actually quite liking watching Rory Stewart at the moment. Well, he didn't so do that, did he? Oh, he no, did. he did. So he no, did he that, did. Yeah. And I just think he's great. He's out there with his mobile phone saying, come and meet me. I'm in, I think it was Kew Gardens or something. Come and chat to me. So I think he's got a very fresh approach to this. But um, 
Yeah, I, I don't think Boris will get anywhere near the the front two. I think he'll implode along the way, and um, and I don't think he'll have the backing of the MPs. Actually, I don't think he'll even get down to the final two. Oh, I think he will. After the Brexit party results, I think there are going to be a lot of MPs who are running scared about the future of the party. If if that's the case, I think it's shock because I think we have public standards. You know, the Nolan principles of public life, and super, one of those is honesty. Shocking. And I just think I don't think Boris is fit to be in any political party I certainly don't <laughs> think he's fit to be our Prime Minister and I think he's probably probably broken all of the rules of, of um, standing for public life so I really genuinely hope he doesn't we, get there. Yeah, just bear in mind the, what we said oh, to I'm you. I'm talking about things he's done yeah. in the past, Steve nothing Norris. at the moment. Well, I'm a signed up member of the ABB party, you know, anybody but Boris. Um, but that's because I worked with him for four years in City Hall and, um, you know, I wasn't impressed. I'm going to say any more because uh, that would be very boring. And actually, I happen to agree that I think, uh, you know, he's said to be the front runner with even with the party members. But actually, 61% of the party members don't support Boris. They support another candidate. And what's interesting is who will emerge, if you like, as the alternative that maybe even the party members who are supposed to be so devoted to Boris might might go with. Well, who do you think that would and be? I think, well, I, we, I we was assuming that uh, I would be supporting Jeremy Hunt. Um, experienced, good business person, long-serving minister in a very tough ministry, uh, somebody who saw Theresa May off in January of 2018 when she had a reshuffle and said, "We'd like, I'd like you to move you to business. And he said, no, nah, I think I'll stay, to be honest with you. I've got a lot of unfinished business. In fact, I think you should give me social care as well. And she, of course, said, yeah. Because she's such a brilliant negotiator. She's such a brilliant negotiator. <laughs> and I've been speculating with some of my old colleagues about what would have happened if you'd said that to Margaret, you know. She just said, dear boy, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you. Your car won't be waiting for you downstairs. <laughs> you sound as if you were but about to say that you've changed your mind on I Jeremy have Hunt. slightly because I was very interested the other day when he said that, um, you know, no deal was clearly not accepted and was off the table. My own view is that regardless of its merits, the rule 101 of negotiating is you have to let the other side know that you can always walk away. And that's what effectively no deal represents. Let's not get into the whys and wherefores of WTO rules and whether disruption would take three months or ten years, you know. The reality is you have to let the other side know you can walk away. That's been Theresa May's favourite. So if not Jeremy Hunt, then, then who? it points to Dominic Raab, in my view. I don't know Dominic Raab particularly well, I, you know, but he seems to me to be a very persuasive performer he's very solid he's got some creative ideas he's not just about brexit i think he's distanced himself from the pack uh, of uh, his generation rather interestingly so okay. so far i think he'll be the one to beat do you want me to answer as a member of the hard left or do you want me <laughs> to answer i imagine myself into the head of a tory go Both. on go on let's go do on. the tory one first Okay, in the head of a Tory, I'm thinking, like Siobhan, I think Rory Stewart is quite, um, is, is kind of looking plausible. I think Dominic Robb, the, the ladies really like Dominic Robb. Really? really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do. You should look at Twitter, honestly, especially young Twitter. It's He's completely... apparently released a picture of himself in his rowing gear. Sorry. <laughs> 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 You've obviously seen that picture. I make no comment. I'm past this on with no comment. But um, I think he's daft as a brush, but... He's daft as a brush in... Um... That's never been a disqualification. <laughs> <laughs> so, to, talking as who I would want to... Who I would want to be up against as the Labour Party in an election, I think probably Michael Gove. Really? Yeah, oh, that's yeah. interesting, because I would have thought that he would have been your the worst is, choice for Michael that. Michael Gove, like many politicians, journalists turned politicians, is often the most intelligent person in a very small group but nothing like as intelligent as they think they are. Hmm. So he's kind of completely... He, he thinks of himself as the intellectual's candidate. And he's absolutely... I mean, come on. A man who trawls Facebook looking for policy ideas and comes back with, I'm going to ban punishing dog collars. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's not... He is not a super brain. Nobody ever called him. This is a guy who has been in three departments... Uh, 
In education, you probably created more change. You can argue about whether you agree with the change or not. Personally, I think most of it was absolutely the right way no, to go. No, no, it's appalling. And the reason that Cameron got rid of him was because the National Union of Teachers didn't like him. In my view, that was his greatest qualification. He then moved on to justice, where he undid most of the grayling disaster um, <laughs> that uh, he'd uh, left us with, and then has moved to DEFRA and turned DEFRA <laughs> for all the... And he, for all, he's, for all he's, he's become a green on, zealot, hasn't he? Surely you would approve of that, Zoe. Yeah, he's turned on. it into a department that's actually interesting. Nobody could remember what DEFRA even stood for before come Michael on. Gove went there. This is a terrible indictment of your party, that one idiot comes in and undoes mm. the idiocy not, of the process. Whatever you think of him, he's not an idiot, Okay, okay, well maybe I'd spoken two broad brush strokes, but the fact that Chris Grayling messed something up so badly that Michael Gove then looked good in repairing it is not a ringing endorsement of either okay. the party or the Siobhan. politician. I mean, it's a pretty obvious thing to say, but the fact that there are 11 candidates, which is unheard of for a kind of a leadership race. There's only 11, 11 Lib Dem so MPs, aren't there? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> just, just and un that. unlike with the Lib Dem MPs, we're kind of struggling to find something good to say about any of them. That says quite a lot about the state of the, um, the cadre of the people coming forward. I just want to go back to very quickly on No Deal, because it really annoys me when people say <laughs> No Deal has to be on the table. Do we really shows. have to? It's not yeah, really, yeah, it's not really related thing to the to question. Say about no okay, deal cool. in any kind of um, negotiation strategy no deal means you walk away and you keep the situation as it is the situation as it is is we remain no, in the, the situation EU. As it is that we voted to leave <laughs> yeah, quite that's the point anyway let's go to a final question from angela in Wapping. Uh, in the week that we've heard gavin and stacy will return for a christmas special which tv show would you like to bring back any volunteers to go first on this i would take unlimited series of fleabag i know it's only just ended so I've no, i haven't seen that oh, yet. i've got it recorded but i haven't exactly. seen it yeah, it's really really good and but you know i don't think they're doing a third you series look a little bit like her i i, I, I is that don't want to i don't thing? want to talk about that's it that's a good thing isn't because, it because like seriously there was a point i don't look very much like like her listener i'm much much <laughs> older and i'm not i'm, I'm not hot but there was there, there's there's some oh, similarity know. because it got to the point where like people were going oh my god i can't believe you talked about anal sex on the telly <laughs> i was like what <laughs> can i remind you it's two minutes before nine o'clock sorry yeah. sorry yeah. Yeah. oh only fools and horses oh, how about that for goodness <laughs> sake I thought it was. I, I love some of that I stuff. I know you used to sell second The chandelier cars, really. and God knows whatever else. Who can forget that? And the, the marvellous fall through the bar. I mean, yeah. God knows. It, it was genuinely very, very funny. You'd have to heart of stone not to like it. I, I was going to say Only Fools and Horses, but only if it was set in 2020 with the first female mayor of London. That would be quite interesting to see. <laughs> um, but, ever, uh, ever the opportunities. Ever the opportunities. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that aside, I would say the one thing that I watch almost kind of. Um, every every kind of Friday morning when I'm working from home is Frasier. I just I oh, love it, and I would love sweet. to see that combat. See, I never got that either. Apart from oh, the fact no. that there's a radio presenter with a Jack Russell, radio no. presenter yes, with so, a Jack Russell. Yes, so clever, and every time you see them again, you see something but else. You're not going to go on to try and sing at La Man from La Mancha, are you? Oh, I don't know. I've done a bit of singing lately. I did it on Good Morning Britain last week. I did it on the For the Many podcast. Shall I break into song now? No, says Sophie, my producer, Gideon. I mean, look, I'm now going to reveal that I've wasted countless hours of my life watching Game of Thrones, but not for that ending. They need to bring it back just to remake uh, the final season. It was such a disappointment. I've got to the end of series three and I'm thinking of giving up. Don't Dude, give up. Give Don't up. give up. No, give, give up. When you get <laughs> to the final season... No, No. What the, you, take a <laughs> referendum. <laughs> I think I'm not really in full possession of the facts and I think I'm a bit too stupid to understand whether I should go ahead with it. Anyway, thank you all very much. Gideon Fulton. Zoe Williams, Siobhan Benita and Steve Norris. You can, of course, catch it again on the podcast if you just go to the Global Player or wherever you get your podcasts from. You're listening to LBC. It's nine o'clock. On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. LBC.